it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 143 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today's flavor is the absolutely delicious Costa Rican with notes of milk chocolate and wildflowers. And it is yummy. So good. Where can everybody get this coffee? Bantamroasters.com. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Are you ready to sip some of this delicious coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us and Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. Hello. How are you doing? Wait, is that? <laughs> oh, that's. That... <laughs> I'm great. How are you? I just sang hello. I just. Felt I was. Like I it. was. I was like, wait, are we doing the breed spotlight? What's happening? What's happening? <laughs> hello, hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's warm out. The chickens are doing well. They got their watermelon. <laughs> the babies have been out there in the little enclosure. That makes me really happy. Yeah, we are definitely leaning into integration now. And you know, the three girls that I had. In and out of the garage are now back with their sisters 100%. Mm -hmm. That makes me so happy. Fantastic. So the only ones left to integrate are the babies. Yeah. And we've started. Yay. I feel like that's the biggest step Mm -hmm. is the start. Oh, yeah. Just getting it underway. And I was pretty impressed with the older girls that they went in with. They really didn't pay them much attention. (laughs) They're like, whatever. So I don't know what it's going to be like when they go out, but it's going to be a few weeks. And we did have a listener ask a question about it. They put them in there in an enclosure for two weeks and then let them out. And the big girls started attacking them. Mm -hmm. And what we say to that is go back to the enclosure Mm -hmm. and do it for a few more weeks. Yeah. So, you know, you just have to go slow. Be patient. Yeah. I kind of had the same experience. My girls, like Dolly was the most interested in the new. Dolly the Dominique was the most interested in the new pullets. The other girls are like, whatever. They didn't even look at them. Uh-uh, they were like, whatever, uh, you know, okay. They kind of look like us. They've all got feathery feet, you know. Lucy was the only one, and Lucy's the very bottom of that pecking order mm-hmm. in there. So I know how that's going to go. She was the only one that was kind of looking at them through the fencing. But all in all, it's going well. I mean, they like it out there. They have the Nostera in their little enclosure, mm-hmm. and they use it for shade, and it went really well. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Every day closer to no chickens in the garage. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's right. The babies will be integrated. What's going on on your front? We are working on a new product for our Etsy shop. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm doing these, and these are hand-stitched. I'm doing these little hand-stitched hens that can be Christmas ornaments. They're about the size. Of the palm of your hand. Yeah, palm of your hand. Yep. Yep. Again, I'm completely hand-stitching them from upcycled fabric. And they're going to be on our Etsy store soon. Mm-hmm. And Just in lo- time for the holidays. Yeah. A lot of them are Christmas themed. Like we got some really pretty plaids and things like that. So keep an eye out for them. You can think of us when you look at them on your Christmas tree. I'm having a great, you know, I love making things. I'm having a great time making these. You're loving it. I am. It's peaceful for you. Me, I'd be like stressing out like, oh my God. No. The stitch went this way instead of that way. Well, they're primitive style. So, you know, when you if you know what primitives are, they're primitive style. They're so. like that uh, American kind of folky mm-hmm. kind of yeah. style. Yeah. Kind of like the old farmhouse look. And they're so cute. I can't wait for you guys to see them on Etsy and be able to get some. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be fun. Okay. So on that note, if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, can you head over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review? Believe it or not. We love reading these reviews. They actually make our day. They make us smile so happy. They help our show grow. And, you know, there's two things. Hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And it really does help our show grow in immense ways. 
If you're looking for other ways to help support the show, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell some chicken-loving friends about the podcast. A hundred. You can check out our Etsy shop. We have new tank tops up. We're almost out of some of the other things, though. Limited quantities available. Yeah. The tank tops, get them while they're hot. Because they're flying. They're flying off. And those tank tops are so light and soft. Mm-hmm. We wear them ourselves. Yeah. We love them. Love them. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our levels of membership. And the other thing you can do to help support the show is visit our website, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chicken? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order, and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery. Defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Bum, 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 time. For Breed Spotlight, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> I made our our little uh, line on our recording go way up with yeah, that. Yeah, you should have seen my eyes. I was like, "Good lord, she's gonna <laughs> clip right off the audio." Good heavens! So this week's Breed Spotlight, we're doing <laughs> the Indio Gigante, and it's Gigante. It is Gigante. <laughs> We have had, I think this might be the record setter for the number of requests for a breed ever. So many people, different people have been writing into us that they want this breed spotlight. So we're answering you right now. Here it is. Well, if you get back to our poultry magazine, Green Fire Farm had these hilarious ads on the back where it was like a velociraptor because, you know, it's a very unique chicken. So essentially, we're giving the people what they want. You want Indio Gigante, we're giving you Gigante. (laughs) Gigante! That's yeah. our sounding board. It's yeah, me. yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. This chicken is what it says. The very tall indigo gigante was developed by breeders in Brazil in the 1980s and 1990s in the areas of Minas Gerais and Goiás. And Goiás. The name translates to Indian giant. Now, just remember that this bird was named back before people realized that it was not okay to lump all indigenous groups under the term Disclaimer. Indian. Yes. They look like a melee breed, but the gigante comes without aggression, believe it or not. And the melee's number one thing is aggression. So <laughs> you get all the best of the melee without the worst. So it's really good. Mm-hmm. They are show birds. They are companions. They are surprisingly good layers. But one thing they are not? Fighting. They are not fighting birds. They are very dino-like. You can easily see how chickens are the nearest living re- relative to the T-Rex when you look At the Indio Gigante. Gigante. And they are not AP accepted. They look like a melee, but with Brazilian colors to them, basically. They have some interesting colors, yeah. They do. And they're just beautiful in personality and in appearance, 
So honestly, it's the melee with all the best and without the worst. The only thing is, it is a Brazilian heritage breed. The only thing is the melee is in trouble and the we melee need, needs help. We need to help all the birds. I mean, yeah. this bird is definitely, we don't want it to take the place of the melee, but it does, if you're having a family bird and you want something different. I gotta tell you, I quite like them. That looks different, mm-hmm. that may set you apart a little bit. This I, is the bird. I'd have a couple Higante hens. Higante. Higante. That's a good name just for a roo. I just want to say it over and over again. (laughs) Okay. The best source for information on the breed is the Brazilian Association of Breeders of the Indio Gigante. You got that? I got it. They do have a breed standard. (laughs) Um, They're translating it may have some issues here and there. Okay. I was stumped by something called barbellas. Right. The official definition is a type of pasta. (laughs) <laughs> named for its resemblance to a goat's beard. And this is to represent what this chicken looks like. Well, my conclusion there is that they mean waddles. Barbellas are waddles. Oh, okay. Right? Pasta. Got, right? <laughs> I, I was no good when I was writing this. The gigante, just if you're going by the standard, the gigante should have practically none of the pasta. <laughs> or waddles. <laughs> no waddles I'm going to call the waddles pasta, pasta now yes. mm-hmm. Also, something... In the breed standard was listed as having four fingers. <laughs> and they must be referring to toes. They obviously. have to be. <laughs> it has to be on the translation. Pasta and four fingers. It's a very special breed. It's very special. Now, according to Gustavo El Cantara, who is the president of the Breeders Association, the Gigante has become very popular and sometimes sells for very large sums of money. Okay. Now, of, as of 2020, it had yet to be recognized as an official breed by the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock in Brazil. Okay. The breeders have been tracking the genetics for about four generations. Okay. So it's not really, you know, it's in, from the 80s and the 90s. So it's not that old of a breed. Right, right. So they've been tracking the genetics for around four generations. The fifth generation is speculated should be pure enough to earn them the official title of Brazil's first breed, which will be amazing. Wow. And I could not find whether or not that has actually happened. Okay. I'm assuming it hasn't. Or there, we would be hearing about it. I mean, if it's Brazil, you're going to have some kind of party well, going on there and for there's this a breed. bit of a language barrier there. And clearly Google Translate was, I want to get a parade if this happens. Yeah, yeah. And I want to so, wear a gigante chicken outfit and walk in this parade. What the hell is chicken? wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. Okay. So I love this chicken. Yes. Actually, they're very cool. Some breeders may have raised as many as 20 generations of this bird, but they didn't track the genes early on, so it doesn't officially count towards Uh, establishing the breed. Alcantara hopes that this will happen soon, but he fears competition from the commercial poultry industry and their hybrid layers. Same story. Yeah, it's what we always hear. So according to the Brazilian standard, the foundation breeds for the giant include some undisclosed fighting birds. Okay, (laughs) the melee. The Shamo. And country or their country or local chickens well, that have been just around. Now, this one, I used Google Translate for this. And it, the country. No, lo- no, no. Yeah, Are yeah, you serious? Yeah. yeah. The country or local chickens were translated. <laughs> Are we allowed to say this one here? Common redneck strains. <laughs> this is not coming from us. <laughs> this is Google Translate. Common redneck strains. I was no good. I mean, <laughs> I laughed so hard when I was writing this breed spotlight. I mean, but it has all the birds that you would think looking at this bird. Again, they're on my screen. If you have a chance to look them up, mm-hmm. you're going to see, like, it's so common sense to see what birds are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, up. yeah. I mean, really. In Brazil, they do not consider the Indio Gigante a table bird. The club really seems to discourage slaughter, and they definitely do not consider this chicken to be a fighting bird in any way, shape, or Yay! form. Right? Right. <laughs> Rio. If you're in the U.S. and you're interested in getting yourself some gigante for that reason, you, <laughs> oh, you, you will be disappointed. <laughs> it's gigante, he, but I mean, not for that reason. You get some gigante, but it's not going to fight for you. This is neat, and it's one of the things I really like about them. The color varieties for the Indio gigante are all over the place. And let me tell you something. They're tall. I saw a couple that were spotted like Swedish flowers. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're really, really beautiful. They are definitely a tall breed, and they are maybe the world's tallest breed, with some roosters coming in at about 36 inches flat-footed. So they beat the melee in height? Not necessarily. Some melees are also around 36 inches in height flat-footed. Now, in Brazil, they will put like a measuring stick down, and they will lay 
the gigante on its side and measure it from top of head to tip of toe, uh, while melees are measured flat-footed. So oh. I think the truth here is that they're about the same. They're probably about the same. So And the melee is still the tallest breed in the world, and Higante is just as tall. So They're trying to get something so they can do another parade. Be like, it's the tallest breed in the world. Can they just have a parade in Brazil for? Because <laughs> they go. want to? I want to go. You're like okay. ready for carnival. <laughs> like carnival. <laughs> Make yourself a Higante headdress. That's what I want to do. Okay. I can't wait We're to going. see this. We're going. I'll, I'll go. Well, I'm you might have to make it for me. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Just because the Higante may be the tallest breed in the world, that does not mean they are the largest breed in the world. Let's look at the weights. Well, wait. Okay. That honor still goes to the Jersey Giant. They are still the largest breed in the world. Okay. That is good. They're not the tallest, but they are the largest. Yes, they're the largest. Right. So let's look at the weights because the hens are coming in at, anybody guess? 6.5. That's not that heavy. Mm -mm. And the roosters around 10. So they are supermodels in the chicken world. They're super tall and super <laughs> tall and skinny. <laughs> They're tall and skinny. <laughs> They're the supermodels of the chicken world. So They do have some long legs. I mean, they got the long legs. They're not that big. No, no, they're not. I mean, that's kind of, that's a big bird. Six and a half pounds for hens, tens for roosters. But that's not, that's not Jersey Giant big. No, they're more wide. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the only way to put it. They're not wide. They're just big <laughs> birds. They're wide. And the other one's tall. Tall. Mm -hmm. Short Are you tall. fat shaming? Do not <laughs> fat shame my Jersey I Giants. I love Jersey Giants. Okay. I'm just pointing out the difference in their body shaping. Yes, let's look at their comb. It's described as a pea or a ball comb. I think it looks a lot like a cushion comb. It does. It's really cool looking. According to the standard, straight combs on a gigante are a disqualification and should not be bred. They want them out of there. Yeah, and no breeding them. Okay, so they have very long, well-muscled legs that are mm -hmm. yellow. I mm -hmm. mean, muscular so the feathers, when they come in, the whole body is going to be covered with a tight knit of feathers. And they're hard. And what we're saying is there's not a lot of down feathers. Yeah, it's, they don't have much fluff. It's There's no fluff. So basically, it's all the harder feathers. Which is probably left over from their DNA that did come from game birds. Exactly. And they're small to medium tail that sits moderately upright. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what they look like. Now... I wouldn't have guessed that these hens are very good layers. No, I would have assumed like the melees, they, they're not good. Yeah. But so something else must be in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. Something that does well because. Let's go through egg laying. Now we're going to, from hen to hen, it may change. They're anywhere from 160 to 250 per year. Okay. Now 160, you may say, isn't very no, good. Okay. But okay. if you get the one that lays between 200 and 250, that's good for this bird. Actually, I saw 250 plus. Yeah. So it depends on every individual breeder, how mm -hmm. the genetics came through. Now, I should mention, and I didn't put this in here because I could not substantiate it, but every now and again, I'd see a source that says somebody added barred rock to this mix. I could see that too. Barred rock could get you the laying. Yes. And it could get you, because they're winter layers, a longer year mm -hmm. of laying, which would get you more eggs. Yeah. Now, the eggs are cream to a light brown color, and the hens will go broody. Mm-hmm. So- Which surprised me. I was like- Because you, you don't- You're going to have a dino. You don't think that you're going to see like a melee-looking chicken going broody. No, you're going to get a dinosaur in your nest box. I mean, I, that, you need to have some extra large nest box for these chickens. Yeah, you kind of do. Because they're, they're big girls. I mean, the hens are smaller than the roos, and the roos yeah. are the ones that are the biggest. And right? I guess- once they but, lay those long legs down, it's probably not a big deal. <laughs> lay those long legs down, baby. <laughs> they are long chickens. I mean, they are. I'm just going to classify them as the supermodel of the chicken world. And I think they're on the card you gave me for my birthday. No, that's a game bird. Well, they do have game bird in them. They do. Okay. So let's go on. Well, the Breeders Association noted that clutches that hatch under one of the broody hens average about a 70% hatch rate. That's really good. It is. Now, the incubators, though, incubators average around a 95% hatch rate. It's really good genetics. Though. It is, yeah. And, you know, they have a good sit when they sit on those eggs. <laughs> they don't have any booty fluff, so how many eggs can they cover, I wonder? They're big, though. I know a lot of you really wanted this breed spotlight, and you wanted, like, good information, and we're giving you what we found. But it, 
I, we're cracking ourselves up. <laughs> I don't so know sorry. Why. We're laughing a lot we're today. Just, yeah, it's a lot of yes. But I mean, I think it's because I really like this chicken a lot. I like them too. And it I was kind of makes me happy. Yeah, I think so too. This chicken's making me happy. Like, can you see this chicken in your pot? I can. Can you? Oh, this would be the talk of my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be walking your dinosaur. <laughs> I would definitely Wait, get a harness song? and a leash for this chicken. Isn't that a song? Walk the dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is one of the ones that looks just like a dinosaur. Oh yeah, they do. I mean, you could say that. I mean, my neighborhood. I'd be like, come see the dinosaur. Yeah, are you gonna give her a Chanel bag? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we dress to the nines. These birds are intended. Let's make no mistake. These birds are intended to be show chickens, and they are essentially a novelty breed right now. But I think the Higante could make a good homestead breed. That egg laying ability. And, you know, they're very friendly. They are. But, you know, we're going to talk about this later, but they're not great in the cold. Well, yes. They could make an interesting addition to a mixed flock, but we have not found anyone so far to tell us how they get along with other breeds. So do you have the Agante? Send us a message with pictures and tell us what you think. You could get some and you could pretend that you're Queen Victoria spending the afternoons admiring your coach in China's. Oh, yes. You know, because she had those very melee-like birds. I mean, the thing, though, that you have to remember, and I'm going to say it again, it's not a cold weather bird. No, they're not. They have no fluff. They have no down feathers. That's why we were saying those feathers are tight and hard. Mm -hmm. And they are not going to be able to warm themselves without down feathers. No, they're not equipped for it. So this is either a bird for a hot climate or... For generous use of heating panels. Yes. And it may be one that when it's cold, they have to come in for with the heating panel or put them in a, you know, they have to have heat with them because they they do not have that fluff. They would be really good greenhouse birds. Oh, yeah. They would be. But yeah, they definitely need protection from the cold. There's no doubt about it. So where do you get them? Okay. So our friends over at Green Fire Farms imported a batch of Indio Gigantes and they do sell both the unsexed. Chicks and hatching eggs. Cackle Hatchery also has them as well now because these are such a novelty bird right now. You're going to find lots and lots of small breeders popping up that are selling them online, often overpriced and sometimes crossbred. So buyer beware. If you want pure, go straight to Green Fire. And they're not badly priced. They're $69. Mm-hmm. Now, you're going to pay more for this bird because of the novelty That's of That's for chicks. $69 for a chick. Yeah. So, you know, it's well worth it. It's- In some ways, they're like the next I am Samani. Totally. Like they're re- I mean, I saw people who were selling them for exorbitant amounts of money. And if I read through the website, like these people didn't know anything about chickens. No, I mean, go to Green Fire Farms. They're set up. They do all the work for you that you know that you're getting a top quality bird Mm -hmm. there. And honestly, I have been giddy throughout this breed spotlight because I love this bird so much. Isn't it neat? They're really neat. And I love the fact, I mean, I don't want to take away from the melee. The melee, they need our help. So if you can support getting a melee, get a melee. But this bird has all the good of the melee without the aggression. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good family. And I love that. The melee is a foundation. It's an ancient bird. It's a foundation bird for so many breeds, but they do need special circumstances. Definitely. So this brings us to, if you have this amazing gigante, we'd like to see your pictures. Send them to us on Instagram, DM us, or mention us in your story, and then I can just share your story right to ours. It's really easy. Show us your gigantes. Show them to us. We want to see them. That was fun. I was completely surprised that I love this bird. I need the gigante headdress. I know it. For- well, I need a gigante to get some feathers from. <laughs> if you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosty's products with our chickens, and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well-made, and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. 
So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. 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 So we're going to kind of switch gears gears a tiny <laughs> bit. This week's main topic, we're talking about setting up a chicken hospital. Yep. Because this is 1 million percent necessary for every chicken keeper out there. If you are keeping chickens for any length of time, you are almost certainly going to have a chicken become ill or get injured. So birds with minor injuries or non-contagious illness can sometimes stay with the flock. While you're treating. An example sometimes is bumblefoot. Right. A lot of times if they get bumblefoot and you bandage the foot and you do it, a lot of times the chickens won't take to that. And Mm -hmm. if they're still acting pretty normal, they can stay in the flock. Right. But more serious injuries or illnesses generally calls for birds to be safely housed temporarily in their own hospital unit. Yes. So let's go into some of the reasons. First is we need to quarantine them to stop the spread of any illnesses. That's crucial. Yeah. Because we talked about this before with rescuing chickens, Mm -hmm. but chickens are different than other animals. Illnesses go straight through them and they're pretty life-threatening pretty quick. Yeah. There are a lot of them that can wipe out your flock. So So if one gets something that's contagious, they need to come out. Mm -hmm. Putting a bird in a hospital is also less stressful on the bird. It can stop bullying and picking by flock mates. And they're mean girls. Even the nicest hen, if she sees someone sick or not acting right, it's going to be like, kill her, kill her. They are the definition of survival of the fittest. That's why they've been on this earth since they were dinosaurs. Right. So if they see any sign of weakness, and this is why it's so hard to see chicken illness until it's too late almost, Mm -hmm. unless you know certain things to look for, they go after because they know they have to take them out in order to survive. Right. They're endangering the flock. Right. So you need to take them out for that reason. Another one is protects from fly strike. If there's any wounds or anything that's open, they need yeah. to come in. Especially during the summer, time of the year where there are a lot of flies around because fly strike can happen in a 24-hour period. Oh, yeah. It's fast and it can kill your chickens. And it's nasty. And the other thing is you have to have access to them to medicate, treat, see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Once you start to treat a chicken and you put them back in the run, guess what you're going to have to do every time after to get that chicken? Unless it's the world's easiest chicken, you're chasing them around and stressing out both of you. Yeah, because they know. They're so smart that once you medicate them, they know what you're coming in there to get right. for. And it, it happens to all of us. Mm-hmm. I mean, it happens like when I treat any of my girls for Bumblefoot. I mean, they can move on those bandages, let me tell you. Well, you know, Blanche had crop surgery a couple months ago, right? Yeah. She still turns her back on me and won't come anywhere near me when I come and in the And let me tell you something. A chicken will hold a grudge. Uh, she, <laughs> Blanche is the queen of grudge holding. It takes a while for them to get over the fact that you had to handle them. You had to medicate them. You had to give them some fluid. You had to do this. Well, she was on liquid food for two weeks. Yeah. I have not been forgiven for so that. So they need to come into the hospital unit. Now, this takes me back to when I was a little kid. I played nurse and doctor all the time mm-hmm. with my stuffed animals and mm-hmm. with the, my live dog, Molly, also. Molly was a sweetheart. She was like, she was always the patient. Mm -hmm. And you always have to have a hospital area. Right. Because you have to have a clean place to treat them to do all these things Mm -hmm. and to keep them out of stress. Right. Right. Having them in a hospital also lets you observe them. You can see if they're eating. You can see if they're pooping. And poop watch is huge for a lot of things. Oh, my God. When when we're on poop watch, how many times when I'm talking to you, I'm like, I hate poop watch. It's the worst, mm, but it? you need to do it. And they need to be in a place where it's just them so that you know it's their poop. Right. And it's the same with just watching how they're acting. You know, you can, if you're, let's say your hospital is in your garage, you can pop out in your garage five or six times and check them where if it's going to take you walking out to the run, blah, 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 you might not be doing it as much as you need to. Exactly. Because it's kind of this thing out of sight, out of mind. Right, right. So if you set up I'll give you for our example mm-hmm. is our chicken hospitals are in our garages. Right. So we utilize that space to have them right there with us where our coops are on our property a little further away. Even when I had the hospital in the basement, you know, I don't think I went down as much. In the, if it's in the garage, I pop out the kitchen door. It's yeah. very easy. It's very easy to get to. And, you know, having it at a moment's notice is what you need to do. 
Especially if you're monitoring food and water intake. Right. I mean, you need to keep on top of that depending on what's going on with your chicken because you need to know if they're not eating or they're not drinking and you need to start liquid food or something like that. Right. So there's going to be stuff that you should have on hand that you can use. Having a hospital also means you can keep a better temperature and environmental control. Right. So if they need a heater to keep them warmer, if they need fans in the winter, anything like that. Fans in the summer. Did I say fans in the winter? <laughs> yes. If you feel the need for fans in the winter, I suppose I do. you could. <laughs> if you're in Australia, yeah. So yeah, it's all about keeping them as most comfortable while treating them that mm-hmm. you can. Now, they do not like to be away from the other birds. Right. But if the other birds are picking on them constantly and they're having to constantly run away, it's they're- going to speed up whatever is happening to They're going to get no rest and they definitely need rest. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the things that we want to have in our hospital. Right. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about in depth during our retail therapy this week, and that's pop-ups. So we'll just mention it. Yeah. That's number one. You need some sort of enclosure. Right. Right. And then you need to decide your substrate in the enclosure. And there's two different things that we always recommend. We tend to go with shavings. Pine shavings are generally what we use. Obviously not cedar. I think hemp would work just fine. Yes. You need a soft substrate. Unless you have a chicken that likes to eat it. So the, the hemp, and you have to make sure that they're not right. eating it. And if they do eat it, what's your option? Then just shavings or white tails. Yes. So if they eat the shavings, you take those out. If they eat the hemp, you take that out. And white tails, Walmart sells them for two or three bucks a yeah. tail. You just go and you buy like five or six of them. And you have them on hand. So that when you have to watch poop, mm-hmm. it's a pain to clean it. It but is. when you have to watch what's coming out of them, it's the best way. Absolutely. You so, can see exactly what's going on. Especially if you've had someone that, say, has crop surgery. Right. Or someone recovering from some kind of an illness where they weren't eating a lot. Any, really, anything that has a, an effect on their digestive system. There's also a few things that we recommend that you have on hand. It's kind of part of our first aid kit, but mm-hmm. I'll mention them here during the hospital because they're going to be your first go-tos when something goes wrong. Right. And it's a few things. First is Nutri-Drench, and that is a vitamin that you can give by mouth with a syringe to the chicken once a day. And it has it's loaded with everything that they're probably not getting. Right. Another thing is Safeguard Dewormer. Mm-hmm. I just had a crop issue that... It was due to parasites. Right, right. It can definitely happen. So having that safeguard for goats on hand, ready to give. I would say a very strong, well-developed first aid kit for your hospital setup. Have it all ready. Syringes, all these different things for dosing, liquid powder to liquid food, all those different things that you can give a sick bird no matter what. Right. You might want to have some sort of a table or counter space. Yes. So you can put the bird up near eye level so you can work on them in an easy manner. Towels for wrapping if you need to. Absolutely. Good lighting or a headlamp. I cannot emphasize that enough. If you're, say, tube feeding, you need a headlamp because you need to be able to check that trach. This is what I like. Andrea over at Chicken Love Box puts the headlamps in multiple yes. times. I love that. That can be a chicken lady's best friend. Oh, yeah. And you, if you get the love box, you might get one or two in your boxes here or there. Mm-hmm. And I use mine every single day. It's great. The headlamp, it's so great to be hands-free. My eyesight, obviously, is failing. I'm in glasses oh, now. Oh, God, yeah. And when I'm working on, say, Bumblefoot, I will put on the headlamp and my glasses because I can just see that much better. Oh, yes. You can't underestimate the importance of good lighting. It's key. It is. It's really key. So listen back to one of our episodes where we talk about first aid kit. This will help you with the hospital. But we thought that this would have been really good to put out there because I think sometimes it's a forgotten thing when it comes to having a chicken fly. Oh, yeah. And, you know, a couple of other things you can keep in the hospital area. You can keep small bins for soaking. Oh, yeah. You can keep like feeding tubes, things of that nature, you know, more advanced than you're going to use for your first aid kit, but you can keep them all in your hospital setup. And we can't say it enough. Once you have them, you'll feel better about the situation. Forceps. Yeah. Or curettes. Yes. You can buy stainless steel versions of them. Sometimes you can just get them on Amazon if you want to. Right. And the list goes on and on. We've talked about first aid kits before. We have, I think, one or two episodes out there, but we list everything. Two definite episodes. But- 
setting up the hospital and having the things that you need right there, it's going to be the matter, I hate to say it, of life and death sometimes. It can be. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let us know if you ever need help setting up a hospital. Right. And we'll have some good budget options when we get to retail therapy. Yeah. And if you have any questions whatsoever, we're always here. Send us a message. Send us an email. We love hearing from you guys. And that's why we're here. If you have any problems or questions about anything, just message us. We're here. Okay. So let's move on to cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this one's good. It's very good. It's a little bit involved. This is a bit of an involved recipe. So this is one that you could do with your kids on a weekend. Mm -hmm. And it's marshmallow mint chocolate chip ice cream. You don't have to include the marshmallow, but it's really good. It's really good. Marshmallow is great with everything. If you're feeling super ambitious, you can actually use your leftover egg whites to make your own homemade marshmallow fluff. Oh, yeah. And if I have time, that's something I would do for fun. Yeah. But for this recipe, we just went with a jar. The custard has to be completely cool to make the ice cream. So it's a good idea to make it a day ahead of time or at least a few hours ahead of time. Right. Also, you can use just mint extract if you don't want to do the mint infusion. Right. But, and Or you can go to your garden and pick your mint. And then you do the mint infusion. Yeah. 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 Either way. You can do it either way. So. Okay. So let's talk about the ingredients that you're going to need. You're going to need one and a half cups of full fat milk. And then for dairy-free, you're going to use three cups of the thickest dairy-free milk or dairy-free cream or half and half that you can find. It might be oat milk. Right. Yeah. There's a very, yeah, very thick and creamy oat milks. And then you're going to need a cup and half of heavy cream. Now, what are you going to do if you don't have... So if you're doing with the dairy, you do the full fat milk and the heavy cream mixture. If you're doing dairy-free, you're just going to do a straight three cups of that oat milk or half and half. omit the heavy cream, basically. You're going to do a half to three quarters of a cup of granulated sugar. Now, you know in my house, that's going up to one cup. Good Lord. I put the three quarters (laughs) on there for you and you're sending it up to a cup. Okay. No matter, depending upon how sweet you like it. No, I love it. I mean, you you know you're putting marshmallow in this. Oh, yeah. Okay. (laughs) Four egg yolks, one or two teaspoons of mint extract, depending on how strong you like it, a half to one cup of chocolate shavings. You're going to use a vegetable peeler and a bar of chocolate. Yeah, it doesn't have to be fancy. And a small jar of marshmallow fluff. That stuff is good. I love it. It's ridiculous how much gluten I love it. Gluten dairy and gluten free and dairy free all together. It's like a miracle. <laughs> it's so good. So you're going to start by making the mint infused milk or half and half if you're using dairy free. Bruise the mint leaves and you're going to put them in a medium saucepan. Yep. Pour the milk or your dairy free milk over top. Bring it to a simmer. You're going to let it simmer for like five to ten minutes. You don't want this to boil. Keep it at a simmer. Right. You're going to remove it from the heat and let it steep. So the mint is really into that milk. Yeah, yeah. After about an hour, you're going to strain out the mint leaves, set that aside, and move on to the next step. Now, just a reminder, if you're using an electric ice cream mixer, remember to freeze the canister. Oh, yeah. Especially overnight if you can so it's nice and hard. Or make sure that you have ice and rock salt on hand if you're using a churn. Yeah, that's what I use. Yeah. I have the automatic, you have the churn. Yep. You're going to make the custard, and then you're going to chill it again overnight or at least for a few hours. In a small bowl, whisk together the egg yolks and about half of the sugar until the yolks are lighter in color. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to set that aside. You're going to grab that saucepan with your mint-infused milk. Add the cream if you're doing dairy and the remaining sugar. Cook that stirring occasionally on medium-low heat until bubbles start to form at the edge of the pot. And that's when it's going to start to get thicker. Right. And the cream mixture is simmering. Once it's simmering, you're going to move it from heat. You're going to stir in... The rest of the mint extract, if you're using that. Right. And here's that famous We talk about it all the time because all we talk about is eggs. Tempering the eggs. Yeah, it's true. (laughs) It's in every recipe, man. Everything you do is egg-based. You're going to temper eggs a lot. Uh, Yes. So if you don't know what tempering eggs is, you're going to – a small spoonful or small ladle at a time, you're going to add some of that hot cream mixture to the yolk mixture Mm -hmm. and whisk it well. Continue doing that until you've added and mixed in about half of that hot cream – At that point, it should be warm enough. You can add everything back to the pan of cream and return it to the stove. And what this does is it stops the eggs from cooking. Because if you add everything together super quick, those eggs are going to have, you're going to have like. It's like curdle, little egg bits. Yeah. And and if that happens, you can put it through a fine mesh strainer if you have to. But it's nicer to avoid it if you can. 
So put the mixture back on the stove, medium low heat. You're going to cook it until the custard thickens enough to coat the back of a spoon. And check this frequently because you don't want to overcook your custard. No. If you don't have any lumps, remove it from the heat and pour it into a bowl for chilling. If you have the egg bits, this is the time to put it through a sieve or strainer. And then you're going to put it in the bowl in the fridge. Chill it overnight at least or a few hours. You need it to be cold, cold. Mm -hmm. The next day, you're going to set up your ice cream maker. Follow your usual instructions. But you're not going to add the chocolate shavings until like the last couple minutes of churning. You don't want them to break up. Right. So put them in the last couple minutes. You're going to take the ice cream to a bowl or a container. And then that's when you're going to swirl a few big spoonfuls of the marshmallow fluff through it. Exactly. You don't want to like mix it in completely. You want to swirl it through. Exactly. And then you just put it in the freezer, freeze to your desired consistency, and you've got some amazing ice cream. And I always talk about it. Coming right out of the ice cream maker, you want to eat it right away. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it's more like soft serve it's at that point. It's very soft serve. So mine came with, like, the canister that you put in the freezer, uh-huh. and then you put it in, and then you put it back in the freezer so that it cuts a little of the freezing time down. Right. But you can't go wrong with homemade ice cream. Oh, it's so good. I, it is so much better than anything you'll ever have. And that's why, like, dairy farms that serve ice cream are the best. Custard-based ice creams. That's what they do, and they get everything right from the cows, and they're all out there. So, yeah, it's really, really good. Thank you, cows, and thank you, chickens, for ice cream. Try it. You might like it. We love it. I guess in my case, it's thank you, oats, for ice cream. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, oats. Thank you, oats. I appreciate it. So let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. This week's retail therapy, we kind of mentioned it a little bit. We're going to talk about pop-ups and budget shelter options because it's a thing. And they cross all the lines. Like these are... Shelters that you can use for integration, for a hospital, for emergency evacuation. Exactly. That comes in my brain all the time. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, I'm of the thought that you can never have too many of these. Oh, I agree. Because if you if your flock is growing and you have to evacuate for any reason, and there's a lot of stuff going on in the world oh, these yeah. days. There's fires, there's hurricanes, tornadoes, yeah. everything. We can't leave those chickens behind. No. We hear a lot of horror stories of chickens being left behind. Right. And it's just so sad. That's a no. It makes me cry. I don't want to think about it. So we have to be prepared to take them. Right. And, you know, the pop-ups are the perfect hospital setting. Right. They're not super expensive. You're no. probably going to average around $30 to $40. So I have, from the smallest pop-up that I have that I bought... <laughs> It's going to seem weird, but when they first came out at Bed Bath & Beyond, which uh-huh. doesn't exist anymore. Right. And I paid $24. Uh, yeah, my first one was 25 And it's small. It's an, And I use it for, you know, like either chicks or one chicken that's having some trouble. Uh-huh. Now, there's a plethora of sizes. Is it about three by three? Yes. Yeah. So we've graduated to the elongated pop-ups. Right. Which are heaven sent. Well. <laughs> Jen got all the crowed langs and put a hole in mine. Yours is not lasted. Well, and the one I got last year, the oh my god, the Andalusians tore it to shreds. So depending upon your chickens, so this is from having babies in there and outside in them, they will destroy them. But if you have them, yours for, didn't. No, they didn't. Holly Ann's did. Them. Apparently, I have delinquent chickens, man. <laughs> your chickens are like, let me out. Shred so that. you know you cannot have too many. No, you can't. We have several of the. Good size four footers. We have several of the three footers, and we have yet another new long pop up. Yes. And the new ones that are out there now actually have a bottom. Yes. And that's really crucial if you're going to be using this. Like if you're just taking your chickens out on the grass and you want to contain them, right? You know, supervised, obviously. The long pop ups, any of the pop ups without a bottom are fantastic. And you can still get them. I'm checking right now. Yes. The, you can still get them without the bottom. And that's for taking chickens out on grass. Mm-hmm. Now, I have two of those. I will keep them forever. The other thing is when it's super cold outside, like it was last Christmas, zero minus three degrees, I set up my pop ups and brought them in for two days. <laughs> chickens were like, woohoo. Yeah. They're like, it's warm. So, I mean, here's one here. So this one says it's 29 by 29, which is the perfect for one chicken in a small area that is sick. And honestly, that's all you need. Now, if you have a larger flock, if you want to get one that's 20 bucks, you start with that. Sometimes you may have more than one chicken sick. That can be a problem also. 
But Amazon is your first place to check for these things. Right. I guess, you know, there could be a circumstance where you have a predator attack or something and you want to keep birds together in a pop-up. Right. Where you'd want a bigger one. And they can go up to, like we said, the elongated ones are like five feet by five feet or something crazy. Yeah. So they get large. Now, the other places, just be aware, because I know everybody out there is like like TJ Maxx and Ross and all these places. Uh Uh-huh. They have pet sections, and they always have them in there, too. Oh, that's good. Okay. So if you're out there and you see one on clearance or something, buy it. To a lesser extent, it will work if you use, say, dog or cat carriers. Yes. They're not as big. They don't have as much headroom, but they will work. You can find them used at thrift shops and yard sales and garage sales. So they're under our budget options. And I have them from them, too. Mm -hmm. So I bought one, I think, last year, a few months ago. From Tabitha's house, which is one of our favorite thrift stores. Uh huh. And that thrift store every Friday has half off Fridays. Woohoo. So everything, whatever it's marked, is half off. Yeah. So it was, when I looked it up, like a $100 cat carrier. It was big, but not too big. And it was marked $24. So I paid $12. Wow. And that's it a good holds deal. like two to three small chickens. Uh huh. Like for an overnight. That's the other thing. If you want a chicken, so that you can, you know, watch just for overnight. A cat carrier or a pet carrier is a perfect because they'll just sleep in there. Right. So that's another thing. And that's good that if you have to evacuate to have the carriers or if you have to go to the vet, to the you, vet need, yeah. you need something to transport. The carriers are really good. Another thing that you'll find at yard sales and thrift shops are small dog crates. Yes, like the open ones. The open ones, right, that are made of, you know, they're metal. I have a couple of those that I've picked up and they can be very useful for one chicken, again, for evacuation or something like that. Yes. I think everyone that has a flock should at least have one. You can also make them, if you have the ability to cobble together a wooden frame, right? put sides on it, and probably make like a wire lid for it. Usually for that, they're going to be inside, so you could use chicken wire. That's right. the only time that we would say use that. Now, that doesn't work so well for evacuation, but for a chicken hospital, it works great. Or I guess if you've built yourself a brooder box, it yeah. could also double as a hospital. It could double. The other thing I love about the pop-ups is they fold flat. Yes, they do. So you can store 10 of those in a very small area, Yeah, and yeah. it doesn't take up any space. But you can open them very wide, and- You know, like in the winter when I had to bring them in, I had five or six chickens in a pop-up. That's how big the pop-ups are. Yeah. And they have room to walk around and have Mm -hmm. food and water bowls. I think everybody should have at least one. I swear by them. They really are the best thing for convalescing chickens or I use a bigger one for my brooder now. I know. We've graduated to the long ones. Yeah. So after the initial, I'd say first two weeks, I go from the big bin Uh to the pop-up where they can take... A little bit more, you know. I the just air. start them off in a four foot pop up now. Yeah, you just I mean, do you it. can do that. You can do it any way you want to, but they're a good step on the way as chicks are getting bigger. We use them. Okay, oh. so these are options. There's thrift stores. There's TJ Maxx. There's Ross. There's Marshalls. There's Amazon. There's any store that you can get it. Have them in advance. Because I'm telling you, when this chicken gets sick, it's not going to be the best time. No, it's not. It's going to be when you have to go somewhere, when you're running late. It's going to be at night when you're putting them in. Yeah. And to have it already, spend the 20 bucks and have it. It's worth it. Peace of mind. Definitely. Okay. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are profiling the absolutely beautiful Swedish flower hen. Yay. Main topic. This is an interesting one. We're going to be talking about growing and using herbs with your chickens. Yes, we are. Cracking the eggs, we're making mini tot quiches. These are essentially like tater tot crusts with quiche in them. So good. Comfort food. Retail therapy is super fun. We're going to do a book review of a book that is essentially the most comprehensive guide out there for glass hens on nests. And you know we love ours. Oh, yeah. We can't wait for this. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.